Alternative Literary Museum has a compre comprehensive practice in publishing revised text editions online. This activity, which takes place in the Digital Literary Academy, goes back to the end of the 90s. Since then, more than 1,500 literary works has been digitized, edited, and published on the website, and also ingested by Europeana. The process of online publication follows a strict protocol of digitizing and encoding, proofreading, and both technical and scholarly validating. Still, these unique online publications do not fall under the criterion of scholarly or critical text editing. The aim of the whole project is more popularizing than scientific, and the texts themselves lack the philological apparatus required in case of a scholarly edition. Such editions were and are being made mostly in university and academic working groups, resulting in the publication of hundreds of volumes, counting tens of thousands of printed pages. The institute that serves as a professional and organizational center for this work is the institute, institute for Literary Studies of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. The body seated in this institute, the Committee for Textology, provides guidelines and quality control over the activities of critical text editions in Hungary. However, only a very small amount of the critical editions published in print has an available digital version. The new general director of the institute, who is also head of the above-mentioned committee and a well-known philologist himself, has addressed this problem by initiating a new project for digitizing existing editions and publish recently edited ones online. Our museum joined in this project, but already in the first phase of making a draft project online, it turned out that although the basic requirements and guidelines are rather easily and consensually definable, to build a uniform service, a great number of decisions has to be made in advance, and these decisions have to be adapted to almost an unembraceable variety of textual practices and principles. So in the following, I will try to sketch a schematic contextual background around philology in the last two decades. Since only the knowledge of this rather diffuse cultural field would allow one to be well-oriented among recent, sometimes contradictory trends and solutions. My presentation will touch upon two subfields of the problem, and in each case, I will lean on a study written by a real uh, digital philologist. So, philology old and new. In this part of the presentation, my arguments rests upon the papers of Matthew James Driscoll, the Danish scholar of Old Norse philology, and the leader of the working group on digital scholarly editions in one of the biggest projects focusing on digital methods in the arts and humanities in Europe. Something happened in the late 80s in the discipline of textual scholarship, and in the meantime, in the digital humanities as well, but we will come back to that later. This term used to be subsumed under the label New Philology. New philologists attacked some of the most established edit editorial practices and underlying ideologies that traditional philology developed and in many respects holds on to up to the present day. To understand the ideal of traditional philology and the waves of revolution against its methods, a simple but hopefully not oversimplified model may be useful. Old philology always tries to find, reconstruct, restore, or even construct the work. The work is an ideal form purified from any supplements and distortion that happened to appear during the course of time. The work is, or at least should be, independent of any social or material constraint, but also independent of the reception itself, be it the interpre interpretation of the philologist, the contemporary public, or of the reading public of the coming centuries. From a ret retrospective point of view, traditional philology adopted rather aggressive, or at least radical, means 
to be able to stick to this ideal. The most characteristic method may have been the stematic one that has been established by the end of the 1820s. The method uses the model stemming from gene uh, genealogy, the family tree, on which the survived but allegedly distorted copies are branches, and the hypothetic root, as an empty origin, is the missing original work. The constructing of the original text requires high amount of editorial intervention, which is disguised by the figure of emendation. A strong criticism has hit this method in the 1920s, so 100 year, uh, one, a century later. A new editorial policy has been proposed, which involved the choice of the single best text and its conservative reproduction with, with as little emendation as possible. This editorial policy embodies another ideal that still, to a certain extent, influences text criticism today, scientific objectivity as a result of self-refraining self of subjectivity. Rather different theories render this idea naive and misleading at the same time for hermeneutics through discourse analysis to systems theory. Textual scholarship, at least at the level of a reflected theory, starts out from the assumption for decades now that each editorial action is based on an interpretation of the text, a reading that cannot and need not to be independent of the receptive horizon of the philologist. But while scholarly objectivity and the condemnation of the individual interpretation has become outdated view in recent textual th theories, one of the most durable ideology of traditional philology still lives on, the reference to authorial intention. Actually, the principle of referring to the intention of the author, who, fortune for the philologist, is rarely there to object, is a rhetorical figure to legitimize the editorial apparatus and give authenticity to the edited work. But what concerns us here is that we are still moving on an abstract and purified level which manifests itself in the ideal of the work. Traditional philo philology came into being on the basis of classical and Bible criticism in the beginning of the 19th century and then turned into the paradigm of textual criticism in general. The revolutionary change in philology that finally, finally displaced or at least shook the position of the ideal of the work came from the medieval studies. In uh, 1989, a rather polemical French essay was published that marks a turning point in the history of medieval textual studies. It bears the title of In Praise of the Variant, a Critical History of Philology. It argues that instability uh, or variance is the fundamental feature of uh, chiographical transmitted literature, so hand lit handwritten literature. This essay names the traditional philological method of identifying and constructing an original single text, uh, anach anachronism. Since the variant in the Middle Ages it not, is not necessarily a careless accident, but the sign of precious individuality and even a source of pleasure. Bernard Serkigny, the author of this short book, was certainly not the first to point out the instable nature of medieval textuality, but his argument has proven to be the most influential. One year later, and this is the date usually defined as the st starting point of new philology, Stephen Nichols edited a special issue of the periodical Speculum under the title The New Philology, in which most of the features of this new school has been stated. Whereas Serkigny focused the attention to the misleading tradition that underestimates, even defaces or deletes textual variation in scholarly text editing, Nichols has directed attention even farther to the materiality of the text. So to the single document or artifact previously altogether neglected. According to his view, often regarded as material philology, Literary works do, does not exist 
independently of their material embodiments. The, phys the physical form is an, an integral part of their meaning as the book object, the layout, illustrations, and so on. These approaches do not form a brand new starting point or ex nihilo. They are embedded in a cultural trend and scholarly interest which discovered that the conveying medium, or more precisely, the inscri inscribing apparatus as oral literature, handwritten copying or book print, and later recording technique, cannot be separated from the meaning or message conveyed. But these approaches are also part of another trend we could formalize as social turn in textual scholarship that focuses on the human motives, social and economical circumstances of which textual expression forms solely a single part. In this respect, the textual variations, the interrogations of the scribes and the readers, the physical impact on the discourse surrounding textual practice that traditional philology regarded as distortion are meaningful and valuable traces of a past sociocultural situation. The philologist does not concentrate anymore on the original work, but on the originality of the individual copy as artifact. The single original copy is of course not always as valuable a resource of information as a codex may be. The industrial mass reproduction of books produces thousands of nearly identical copies, the difference of which is most likely of little scholarly interest. Still, material philology has reflected the hidden ideologies behind editorial policies. An easy and rather often formulated conclusion may be driven, that in the present age of nearly uh, limited digital storing capacity, the promised land has finally arrived for material philology. Does this mean that the critical edition as such, that follows the model of the book as conveying medium, is a phenomenon of the past, and the future would be the philology of the digital versions? To answer this not that easily answerable question, we have to turn our attention to our next topic, textual criticism in a digital environment. This part of my lecture, uh, in this part of my lecture, the argumentation rests on the insights presented by Klaus Hötfeld from the University of Bergen, former director of the Wittgenstein Archive. In the 1980s, a new tool has been developed to handle documents in a computer environment. The standardization seemed to be vital for encoding text texts produced or preserved on paper, and also to control the production of new texts, and in this way facilitate cross-platform interchange and machine readability in multiple domains and for multiple purposes. The standard generalized markup language, SGML, is a standard prescribed way of presenting a text in a strict hierarchy of serially, serially ordered text elements. As the father of SGML, Charles Gottfarb of IBM Corporation has put it, from now on, the techniques available for pro processing rigorously defined objects like programs and databases can be used for processing documents as well, end of quote. This brief description shows clearly that the prescriptive rules inherent in SGML and other later markup language standards, like XML, reflect the logic of the computer as medium. The notion document is thus not identical, not even similar to the one used in the humanities. The obvious success of the SGML in administration and bureaucracy, and even in security departments, leave no doubt about the advantages of the increased control over the structure, the composition, analysis, and manipulation of texts, texts which are normally of little aesthetic or cultural value. However surprising it may be, SGML met with a kind of enthusiasm in humanistic research dis disciplines as well. The SGML-based text encoding initiative was launched only two years later as SGML became an international ICO standard. The T 
the TEI community aimed at the development of standards for text encoding, especially in the humanities. But the debates concerning the usability and even the underlying text philosophy of TEI appeared parallel to the spreading of the method. From a general point of view, the TEI as an encoding methodology resembles to the practice of traditional philology. In accomplishing a translation between different mediums, manuscripts to printed text, book to computer, it rests upon a demarcation of the substantial and meaningful from the accidental features or elements of the encoded document. New philologists suggested the material, that the material embodiment of a document may be as meaningful as verbal signs inscribed on it, but an encoding into a standard markup language will surely deface any material element, be it informative or meaningless for the interpretation of the philologist. Not only material elements are eliminated, also other textual features are considered meaningless in this transcribed text, be it spatial arrangement or orthographical idiosyncrasy. One may rightly note that these shortcomings may stem from translation between mediums and not from the standard itself. But there are more specific debates that focus closely on the encoding method. One of the most often mentioned arguments concerns the OHCO model. According to this model, the text can and must be described and encoded as an ordered hierarchy of content objects. In a research project carried out by three scholars from the University of Brown, Harvard, and Boston, it has been stated that although the OHCO thesis is affirmed by a wide range of authors and editors from the late uh, 1980s and has been associated with certain approaches to text processing and encoding of literary texts, one can easily find counter examples, substantial ones and not just accidental, that question the assumption that any text could be described as a single or even overlapping ordered hierarchy. Another issue concerning the OHCO model questions the method of cutting the text into discrete segments named here objects. Each segmentation is based on, however competent, particular interpretational reading of the text but if this segmentation is substituted for the source itself, so to say burned into it, then this discriminates forever other ways, other ways of segmenting and understanding. The problems discussed have implications not only for text encoding and the, under and the understanding of the nature of textual communication, but raise fundamental issues in the logic and methodology of the humanities. All the more so since the OHCO model still forms the background logic of the text encoding practices using the TEI standard, mostly without reflecting the above issues. There are some projects that try to develop alternative markup languages to avoid editorial constraint to eternally break up a text into a system of ordered objects, but none of these experiments have succeeded in reaching a wide acceptance and now a short conclusion. It is surely not simple to draw conclusions from all these competing schools, ideologies, and practices of philology, digital or not. As in many cases in the digital humanities, as one aims to make a decision about the methodology to bring about a concrete objective, a simple correlation seems to be at hand. One may choose a methodology fully fitting to one's vision, philosophy, and needs regarding the objective, but then an individual or at least modified solution has to be de developed since widely spread standardized solutions have obvious and in many cases unacceptable shortcomings. Or for the benefits of standardization, which is platform independence and large scale accessibility, one gives up at least partly the special, special needs required by the objective. In our case, publishing critical editions online, there are many examples of both, of our either highly specialized or highly standardized solutions, but if these two could be synchronized, is not yet obvious.